Well, today, brothers and sisters, we are starting part two of our series on the Gospel of Mark. And uh, so hopefully you have uh, received your handout and you can use that if you want. Uh, I know we said that it wasn't a quiz that got marked or was any pressure or anything, but I have to confess that two of the people in our family totally and utterly failed last week's handout. It was terrible, but it's okay. They actually just missed a page and didn't realize it was there. But it's fun to be able to do, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing this journey with you, and I hope you are uh, enjoying it as well. Today, we are going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 45. And that's, that's only, uh, you know, a little bit over 30 verses, uh, which, you know, seems like a lot for a sermon uh, perhaps, but, um, and, and it is a lot in the sense that there's a lot that happens uh, in here because Mark, we talked about last week, is very action-packed. Uh, but I will invite you to turn with me right away to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 45. And this picks up uh, into uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Last week, we heard about how Jesus uh, Jesus was proclaimed and announced by John, and then Jesus was baptized by John, and then uh, Jesus went into the wilderness, and, uh, and then we pick up, uh, John is put into prison, and you can read in more detail about that particular episode in other Gospels, but we pick up uh, just after that. And so Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 14 to 45. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is, has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Jeb Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by a demon, by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure, impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once, with a strong warning, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and talk, began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, one of the things that we need to notice is, is the secret, the messianic secret that is throughout this story. And we talked about last week uh, as being throughout the gospel. Why does Jesus tell people to be quiet about the reality that he is the son of God? Well, that is because, remember, we Jesus in in Mark's gospel, we hear about how Jesus doesn't want people to be distracted by claims to his divinity, even though they're true. He doesn't want people to be distracted by the debate around that. Um, he wants people to focus on the actual good news that God loves people and has come that they may be redeemed. So just don't, don't forget that, okay? Um, but then we also need to dive into what exactly Jesus is teaching his disciples. And we see that in the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, one of the first things he does is he recruits Andrew and Simon and James and John, and, and he starts off even before that by proclaiming the good news. Now, his recruitment promise, as it were, to, uh, to James and John is that he will teach them how to fish for people instead of just fishing for fish. So in the light of this, in the light of this, this call, we need to look at all of the following episodes as Jesus teaching his disciples to fish for people. We can't just say, oh yeah, Jesus is going to teach them to fish for people and then ignore that for the rest of the gospel and say, okay, well, that was nice. We have to realize that part of what's happening in each of these episodes is that Jesus is teaching them to fish for people. So how does Jesus teach his disciples to fish for people? By example and by teaching. In Mark's gospel, we see explicit, especially the by example part of Jesus' discipling technique. So so today, we're going to look at what are the fishing te techniques that Jesus teaches his disciples. Well, the first technique right off the bat is spear fishing. So in spear fishing, you patiently wait and you watch the water carefully. And when you see a particular fish, you aim carefully and you throw. That is what Jesus does to Simon and Andrew and James and John. We can almost imagine Jesus patiently, quietly, and prayerfully walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, asking his Father in heaven to reveal to him through the Holy Spirit just, just which fish he had to spear 
Obviously, Jesus' choice is perfect. For all four of them immediately follow Jesus. Simon and Andrew dropping their work in the middle of their fishing expedition, and James and John leaving behind their father in the middle of preparing for theirs. So this is the first fishing technique Jesus teaches them and us. Spear fishing. So how is it done? Well, number one is prayer. We need to be constantly asking our Heavenly Father throughout the day, every day, to reveal to us by His Spirit whom we need to call to follow Jesus. Right? We need to be asking God, praying without ceasing, who should I be talking to? And then along with that needs to be the watchfulness that comes with spearfishing. You can't just randomly throw a spear in the water and hope to catch a fish. You need to actually intently be paying attention. So too with this, fishing for people. As we walk through our days asking God to reveal the people we are to fish for, we need to watch and listen for God's answer. The the still small voice that prompts us to talk to this person or that person, or that prompts us to do something for this person or that person. And thirdly, we need to take action. It's all well and good to to listen and be patient and to pray and to wait and to watch. But if we don't throw the spear, we're not going to catch any fish. So we need to take action. When we hear God's call to fish for a person, we need to answer that call. It, It may not be as dramatic as shouting across the water to someone, follow Jesus! but it might be. It might be as simple as saying, how are you today? Are you you really okay? Can I help you with that? Regardless of whether the action is a big, bold one or whether it's a small, everyday one, when we hear the call, we must act to spear the fish that God has pointed us to. The second kind of fishing that Jesus teaches his disciples here is bait fishing. In the next little episode we read, we hear that Jesus is preaching to the congregation at a synagogue and subsequently driving out a demon from a possessed man from that congregation. We see that Jesus proclaims truth boldly, and commands the demon boldly as well, with authority, the scriptures say. It is as if Jesus dangles something new before the congregation, godly teaching, backed by authority, and then he watches to see their reaction. (laughs) Sure enough, the congregation rises to the bait. One of them, possessed by a demon, tries to distract the crowd from the actual good news, the good news of God's love for fallen humanity, by stirring up controversy about Jesus being the Holy One of God and by asking if Jesus has come to destroy them. But Jesus drives out that demon and commands it to be quiet, thus eliminating the distraction, hopefully. The rest of the congregation rises to the bait by hearing and being astonished by and spreading the word about Jesus and his teaching. So how do we employ the bait fishing technique? Well, again, we start with prayer. Always being in prayer for the Spirit to guide us in all that we do, and to guide us to the people we should connect with, and how. And then secondly, we need to set 
the bait. Proactively and boldly, as hard as this may be, speak humble truth in love, including the truth of the good news that God loves all people. And then thirdly, again, we need to take action. Action. When people take the bait, either positively or negatively, because we'll get both reactions, we need to respond out of the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in love with more of the truth and the authority of God's good news. The third technique that Jesus teaches his disciples is net fishing. And, and this would have been the actual fishing method that they were probably most familiar with. They were casting out their nets when Jesus found them, or at least getting ready to. So following the episode in the synagogue, Jesus continues to broaden his fishing expedition, right? First by healing Simon's mother-in-law, and then by healing the many, many people of the town who were brought to him. And after a pause to do some more listening to the Spirit and prayer, Jesus announces that he is called to go around the whole region. In the net fishing that Jesus and his disciples would have been familiar with, they would throw nets out into the water and after a time, drag them back into the boat with whatever fish happened to come in. Here, Jesus is employing a net fishing technique for the whole area of Galilee, throwing out the nets of the good news of and God's healing, and seeing what fish or people come in. So what does net fishing look like for us? Well, prayer. <laughs> Notice that Jesus himself takes time for prayer, and only after he has taken time to pray, he announces that he must throw his net wider. And then, of course, we need to be casting the net. We need to be sent, hooking the bait and sending the bait out in the previous example. And here we need to be casting the net. Our calling is, brothers and sisters, I, I know this is so uncomfortable sometimes, but our calling is not always only to the individuals with whom we come into contact. Sometimes our calling is to speak to groups of people about the love of God. Maybe our, our, our fellow employees or, or colleagues at work or, or maybe our friends or, or maybe in a meeting or wherever you may go at a store. I don't know. Sometimes our calling is to speak to groups of people about the love of God. How do you know when? We hear when we pray. And then we pull the nets back in. Jesus gathers followers from each of these towns, not necessarily that they all physically leave whatever they, life they have and follow Jesus physically, but that they become, in their own villages, disciples of Jesus. No doubt, some of the people chose not to follow Jesus. The, the net fishing technique doesn't guarantee what kind of fish you catch, nor does it guarantee how many fish you'll get, you'll catch. So, so too with fishing for people. Sometimes with this technique, you may catch no one with the gospel. Sometimes you might catch many. That's not our worry. Our job is to cast the nets and to pull them back in. The last technique that Jesus teaches his disciples in this, uh, this segment of Scripture is the fishing for people by trawling. Now, this is not something that most of us do, but trawling is, is a process where 
uh, modern fishing boats drag nets along the bottom of the sea to pick up whatever comes in. In this case, the fish that is trawled is a leprous man, a man who is untouchable in the society of the time, a bottom dweller according to the society of the time. This, this fish came to Jesus when Jesus was in the area and understandably begs Jesus to heal him if he is willing. Notice that when Jesus, when the leprous man begs Jesus to heal him, the text says that Jesus is indignant. Why does it say that? Because of course Jesus wants to heal the man. In fact, the fact that the man even asked, has to ask Jesus if he is willing is offensive to the sense of the gospel the love of God for all people. Yet at the same time, Jesus knows that this is how leprous people are treated in that society. And so Jesus is not indignant at the man. Jesus is indignant with the reality that a person like this leprous man is so rejected by society that he has to even ask whether or not Jesus would be willing to heal someone like him. So what does trawling look like for us? You guessed it, prayer. Again, still, always, watching out for the Spirit's voice calling us to the least of these. And secondly, getting to the bottom. Many of us, including me, are most comfortable staying among people who we feel like are like us. But Jesus models time and time again fishing among the weak, the poor, the sick, the oppressed, and the ostracized. How are you and I connecting with those people? Trawling in this context means getting out of our comfort zone and being with the people who are not like us, at least in our own heads and hearts. And then lastly, by serving. Once we are at the bottom, Jesus does not call us to berate or yell at the people down there or, or say to them, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, or if you had only done this, or if you'd just done that. <laughs> Instead, he calls us to serve, to bring healing, to bring comfort and peace to make people feel that they belong, because they do. So, brothers and sisters, these are the fishing techniques that Jesus teaches his disciples. Spear fishing, bait fishing, net fishing, and trawling. And these are things that we can learn to do through the gospel, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, and through practicing these things ourselves. So, let us, brothers and sisters, hear the good news, of course, that we also are loved. Let us recognize the fact that God has fished for us and caught us. And that is so good. But then let us also hear the call of Jesus to be fishers of people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for teaching your disciples how to fish, 
through Jesus. O oh Lord God, help us. Help us also to learn how to fish for people. Not only in some intellectual way that we know the theory of how to fish for people, but instead help us to actually do the fishing for people. For that is what you have called us to, all of us. Lord, please strengthen us. Please give us courage to do that fishing wherever we may be this coming week and in the days and months and years to come. Lord, may we, through the power and guidance of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, whose gospel we proclaim, may we be a part of the great harvest of people who have been fished for you, O God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.